products for people to learn human, uh, human anatomy from. And this is all without scan data. This is just sculpting in the program. And then uh, you can see here, this is the digital output and uh, kind of see the scale that we were working at. And this is me doing sort of paint masters in the real world now, but a lot of the paint design I would do in ZBrush before doing it traditionally. But from there, I started uh, thinking about how could I expand into animals, and then I was the co-founder of a new company, uh, uh, which is Evolutio, which you see on the first slide there. But if I was going to make reference for you guys of the new generation, it had to be sort of next level. And so we had to look for superior reference and study. And in this case, we're using a combination of scientists and, and uh, natural history museums we're actually taking animal specimens and dissections and uh, making sure that everything we're doing is medically accurate. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I'm an art director of a whole bunch of artists who work on all the animals together. And we typically ask the artists to pick a favorite animal that they would love to do uh, because they're passionate about it. And they'll end up being an expert in that subject matter. So uh, in this case, we see if there's also uh, it's a little off-putting, but we also like to see if the animal exists without fur. <laughs> Much easier for us as anatomists to try to sculpt and capture animals if we can see what's happening under there. In this case, this is a baboon uh, that suffers from uh, hair loss. But uh, I want to share a bit of a case study here from uh, how we use ZBrush in design and production workflow. Uh, I'd like to sort of highlight one of our hero artists uh, this is the specimen that we started with. This is a, uh, a dissection by an amazing anatomist, Dr. Shui. Um, and so this is our starting point. So we would scan this in, which is, you know, fairly typical these days. But this is just showing you the raw scan data just for us to kick off. But at the same time, the artist uh, who basically we assigned to this animal, uh, she's a bit of a rock star. This is Crystal Seiyu. And uh, she's uh, uh, let me record some of the behind the scenes while she and I are doing uh, meetings together. And this is her just learning more about the animal here in ZBrush. And for those of you new to ZBrush, she's really just playing uh, with this with the animal, getting to know the animal, which she has to become an expert on. And she's just playing around in both paint and sculpting of the gesture of this animal and trying to get into it, almost like studying the portrait of this animal since we're going to represent it in the best way we think possible. So although she is super fast, this is sort of ZBrush's time-lapse mechanism, so she's not quite working this fast. But you can see that she and I, although there's no audio here, we're talking over the top, and we're trying different poses uh, and different ways of using the program here. And we've gone from a seated pose to a, um, like a walking pose, uh, which Krista was saying she felt would be a nice, uh, perhaps way to represent the animal. And then we're looking at how would we maybe look at an open, out, uh, open mouth position versus closed, since the mandrel here is a, uh, an amazing animal with the mouth open. And so you can see ZBrush is allowing us to seamlessly sort of just swap in and out of pieces and quickly reproject those um, while we're working. So from there, we'll often just sort of play, uh, once we've played in 3D, we'll bounce into 2D and it is quite seamless to jump between ZBrush and programs that you might like, like Photoshop. Uh, so here, uh, I asked her to sort of basically turn to the side view, and I think coming up here, we'll, we start to play with the silhouette of the animal uh, in, in 2D. So we'll just let this uh, play out here. Perhaps we'll jump to the next one. So you see here, we've jumped into Photoshop, and now uh, Crystal's sort of playing with the silhouette shapes before going back into now looking at product design. In this case, this is a more refined version of the model. Oops, sorry. I guess I'm getting used to uh, the program here. Yeah, and you can see that, that now we're looking at well, how we're going to actually reveal the, uh, the anatomy of this model. Uh, you can see we've got some cross sections of pullaways. So this is all designed to become a physical product in this case, right? So that's why we're starting to see the removal of hair and uh, 
where we're deciding to show or highlight anatomy. Kind of cool, so we'll have some of these assets behind in the booth afterwards we can play around with and, and show you. And here you can see um, basically notes over the top of that. Okay, so this is a work in progress example. Perhaps if I can give you uh, some models where we go deeper, so game companies and film companies hire us to assess their rigging and things uh, for movie, for motion design. But in this case, if we have a hero animal, like a, uh, a, a wolf or a horse or a big cat, we go deeper, and in this case, uh, this is the artist Idan, uh, and he's done an amazing job of from literally ground up building this asset. And here we're back in the program ZBrush, and you can see that he's literally building from the animal's skeleton all the way up. And he's taken this all the way through into texturing, rendering, the fur, everything. Uh, this isn't quite our photo reel renders, you know, as far as being super realistic, but you can see the potential of uh, everything that he's done here. Quite an extensive model. You know, down to deeper, uh, deeper anatomy, not just superficial. Um, and then how do we bring that to life in the real world? Well, again, we've talked about the 3D printing, but in this case, this is a asset that Tan, my colleague, is going to share in just a moment. But this is the 3D print, and this is me doing a paint job on the 3D print to kind of sign off on how this is going to look in mass production. So for those of you who are just digital artists or traditional artists, I definitely recommend having both skill sets in your back pocket. They feed each other. Right? So if you haven't dabbled in traditional mediums, I encourage it. And if you're a traditional person, to dabble in digital also. Okay, so this is us designing uh, the look of an asset digitally in this case, doing the paint job all digital. And this is a uh, terrific horse that was sculpted uh, by a colleague of mine again, uh, Vaughan Smith. And here he is with the actual output of his, his asset. He looks pretty proud, he should be, it's a pretty amazing job. And you see we try to show deeper dissection as well as the, uh, the more superficial. Okay, so again, if you're new to ZBrush, I highly encourage, remember I started as a graphic designer and here we all the way are through Lucasfilm into ZBrush, is if you open things, you might be a little intimidated by the amount of things you've got to choose from. But even with the level of experience I have, uh, I'm typically down to just a few brushes. Right, that's really all I use for 90% of all the work we do. And in, uh, in this case, something like this sculpture, I really just used one tool for 80% of the work. So I'd recommend you just pick a task you'd like to do, focus on that. Uh, Zebra Central or Maxon or whatever is a great place just to try to learn about that or YouTube. Uh, and basically get into it and not be intimidated by the way the interface looks. Okay, so. The next uh, movie I've got here is a nice introduction for my colleague Tan. This is a sculpture he did uh, here of a dissected crocodile, and uh, perhaps I'll just let him take over, and, and uh, you guys can join us behind the booth here for any questions later. So thanks very much. Uh, please welcome Tan. All right. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to take over. Hello, everyone. My name is Tan, Tan B. So I'm currently working as a creature modeler at a company called Industrial Light and Magic. So I don't have that many photos or pictures to show, but uh, if you guys are watching Mandalorian, uh, the opening, opening scene, there's a, another crocodile or alligator-ish creature. That's what I've done. So all right, I will just continue the conversation about keeping it simple in ZBrush. All right? So I'm going to show you a few models which is the asset that we create for the 3D printing process. In the particular case, we have the bear right here. So if you are interested, you can come over here and take a look at it. So in a way, right now, we really try to simplify all the muscle features right, by using the tool of ZBrush. So I'm going to exaggerate it even more in today's demo by only using two brushes. Right? The first brush Andrew already mentioned, which is the move tool. So this is the one I'm going to use as a primary tool to tweaking the shape. And then there's another tool 
built into the ZBrush for a long time. It's no longer by default in this um, brush panel anymore. But uh, you can find it at the brush panel, right, under a light box. And if you go to the insert IMM, insert IMM and then we have this insert sphere. So basically, this is my foundation. Those two brushes allows me to do majority of my work. All right? And uh, as Andrew already showed you, that most of our asset, to make sure everything is medically accurate, we do have a set of skeleton underneath it. Right? So let me show the skeleton just to make sure. There you go. All right. But there are obviously a few while I was working on it. So today, I'm gonna, uh, in my demo, I'll just show you how do I blocking in, say, if I want to make a new arm, right? And then ZBrush has this very cool feature that you can take a screenshot of your existing model or if you download 3D scan data online. So you can take a screenshot of it, say, Shift plus S, I'm making the screenshot. So I can use that as my reference, right? So now let me go back to the bones. So I'm going to start to use those two features I mentioned, start to laying in the muscles. All right, simply by using the insert sphere, I'm going to work on this tablet. It's easier for me. All right. So I'm going to start to drag in a new sphere. And then switch to move, to move tool. You can highly. Um, customize your interface and then giving hotkeys for sure. So while I'm really working on creatures like this, I have my hotkeys assigned so I can quickly switch in between those two brushes. All right, but in this case, I just keep it simple, right? Usually to keep it uh, like um, at the foundation level, you want to make the brush bigger. And many times I found it's easier to control the brush by changing the intensity to a lower level. So this is not only me using this uh, process in the industry, for sure. There are many, many other artists, no matter if it's doing cartoony artwork or doing more realistic uh, artworks, they're all using this, right? So you can start to tweaking this around and then start to evaluate the form from all different angles, try to read the silhouette of the muscles, and then really try to find the origins and the insertions. Where's that muscle connecting to, right? Because we... Some of those areas, we really don't see the underneath muscle in this case, so I can fake it a little bit. But if you want to expose the underneath muscle even more, we'll do very nice um, research to make sure all the muscles are attaching to the correct bones. Okay, and then switching, once I have the first muscle in, I can switch back to the insert sphere and then go for the second one. Start to pull, oops. All right, this is where having a hotkey will be easier. Let's go to the M, and then looking for a move tool. And start to drag it around. All right, throughout the process, you may find, oh, it's actually fairly easy, but um, continue what Andrew has said, that uh, you do need to have the artistic foundation, right? Sometimes when you play the foundation, like uh, the basic forms, it's not uh, only giving you the big volume or the main feature of the creature, but sometimes it's putting the creature like uh, together for you to read the form even from distance. Right? So from there, I'll start to keep tweaking. Insert another muscle. I'll start to go with the bicep. So this one won't be super accurate but uh, show you the idea, see how far I can go within this timeline, all right? So keep going, insert muscles, tweaking around. So what I'm looking for are not those smaller individual muscles at this point. Most of the time, we try to analyze the form and then see the major muscle groups that uh, give you the overall shape. And then if I have to do later, I will show you how do you cut them up and then start to uh, separate the muscles. Okay, keep going with that. So what this process does is, it's really helpful for you to find, you know, 
which muscle is on the top and which muscle is underneath. So the overlapping feel of this uh, process that ZBrush giving you is kind of hard to sculpt, right? And at the same time to keep the form clean. So this is where it's super helpful to keep the resolution very low. ZBrush is capable to do super high resolution, but at this point, we don't want to deal with that yet. All right, let's keep going. Insert sphere, do another connection. OK, I'm going to increase the intensity a little bit, just so it goes a little faster. If any form, I need to wrap around the bone. I'm going to push it. And this becomes a little stretchy, but I usually don't worry about it. As long as it gives me the silhouette, I'm totally fine with that, right? ZBrush also can, um, uh, having the feature that you can either do the decimation, or you can do the Dynamesh, basically to erase all those stretchy points. Later, I'll show you that. OK. So as soon as this, we're going to start to playing with the form. And then also, there's another um, feature about this brush is each time you insert a new brush, this is where showing you the wireframe. It's actually going to give you a new poly group, right? What that allows you to do is that you actually quickly doing the selection in between different pieces. So at this stage, I have few techniques that I can use to switching in between different muscle groups. But the um, best one was to use the similar move tool, but this one is called move topological tool. So what this does is actually, it will generate an auto masking around the shape. All right? You see the first the geometry I'm touching is the one I'm controlling. I'm not really modifying the other pieces. In the other side, if I use the regular move tool, I can make a major movement while it's no masking, right? I can make a major movement together. So switching in between those brushes is very helpful for me to move forward. OK, let's keep going. This is where I'm going to show you that uh, after laying in the major muscle group, what you can do next, say, if I want to split the smaller muscle groups right, to having all those smaller details. Here, I'm just going to give you this major form first. Right. Right. Can you insert the muscles underneath another one, like that. OK. So from there. I can hold down my control shift key to isolate this piece of muscle. Say I want to start to divide, making the divisions of different muscle groups. But uh, they're still reading as a whole, right? So I can hold control shift, click on this individual polygroup to hide the other pieces. And then over here, by holding control shift on the brush menu, I can uh, change to the slice curve brush, right? So this is where you can slice in and make new polygroups. Oops. OK. By holding down the Alt key, you can bend the curve and to make whatever the cut you want. So the initial one didn't work very well, so let me redo it. All right. Hold down Control, tap on the Alt key, so you can start to bending the curve. And release, and make a new polygroup. Okay. Dragging, say those are the polygroups. I need to have to have a separate pieces. And then after that, I'm going to do, um, use the feature I talked about, which is called the Dynamesh, which is one, removing the stretch, stretching right, on the geometry. Two is to separate those new polygroups poly groups into new pieces. So it's just simply going to their geometry and they go for Dynamesh. And I uh, want to turn on a feature underneath the Dynamesh called Groups. And I will go for that. Usually, I just go by default and see what happens. And if I need to do any adjustments, I'll do that after. OK. Since this is giving me a lower resolution at this moment, but uh, yeah, it's really depend on what you do. If you feel this is too low, you can always go back and just Control Z and then do it again with a higher resolution. And the other thing I noticed that 
currently I have uh, several uh, muscle groups um, assigned a new polygroup, right? What I can do is to go to my polygroup panel, go to my polygroups, and then I can do an auto group, right? Most of the time, we start with the model uh, symmetrically, so it's easier for us to control both sides, and then we will make the pose change. But in this case, after I make a new auto group, um, each individual piece will be assigned a new polygroup. So you can see they are all different colors, right? So from there, I can go back to my Dynamesh, Geometry, Dynamesh, and then turn down the groups. And I will go for a slightly higher resolution, just double that, and Dynamesh. And then here, you can see this ZBrush will rearrange the polyframe for us, giving the even, um, distrib evenly distributed quads for me to move forward, either subdivide or either uh, to you know, keep sculpting with the existing shape. It's much cleaner. All right. So from there, I can keep going with the move topological tool if I need to make any major movements. It's a very handy tool for me to move one muscle without affecting the other ones. And uh, there are definitely a lot of demos to show you, you know, how to use the ZBrush to sculpt in high resolution details. But this is, to me, the key that, uh, to have your successful model. Right? So you can literally see what's going on right here already. Right? If the this is, doesn't look correct, no matter how much more details you are adding, won't count, right? And then once for a while, I also use the feature over here under the material, which is also another default material called flat color, to rotate my model around and just to see the silhouette and try to read the curves to make sure that those are all working fine. Okay, let's go back to. All right. Here, I think I lost uh, that uh, initial cut, so I'm not going to do that again, right? Because it was a little stretching, so I'm up over here. Isolate that and use my slice curve, cut it up. Hold down Alt key to follow the features. And from there, I'll use Dynamesh with polygroups again. This will give me the divisions. Right. I can quickly, instead of insert another sphere and then try to modify the topology, here I can quickly create a new shape and I can tweak it around. This will, following the original shape at the same time, give the additional details to it. All right. So this is a simple introduction of this feature that we are using. We are rely on this feature. So hopefully that's a uh, um, nice tip for you guys to start things uh, using simple tools. All right, don't uh, make this too compl complex. Um, keep it simple and have fun with it. All right. Any questions? All right. So I'm gonna do the demo with Andrew on the back. Or how how do we do with the time? Is it good? Okay. All right. I'll keep tweaking this around a little bit if that's enough time or or any questions. Okay. okay. Does anybody have any questions here on the floor? Bueller, Spigoli, Dufresne, one of them. Any of them going to hit? None of them. Hi, Simon. I see you over there. Thanks for coming. <laughs> it's been great having you here all day. Oh, we got a question over here. Would you like the microphone to make it a little bit easier? Uh, how long does it take you to kind of get to a render where you're having a full project done? Usually our timeline is around two months. Uh, yeah, because we are a group of artists working on the side. We are not uh, dedicated uh, to working on this project yet. Yeah, but usually two months. And what about the production time? Yeah, it's faster than production time yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And he has the piece here live too, the bear that yeah, he's been working on it. So you can see it. Mm -hmm. Online, it's right there. I don't know if you can see it from yeah. your view or not. All right. I'm just going to show you a few more pieces um, or a few more assets. I'm going to Vanna White the piece. Using the exact same process. So this is from um, another amazing artist, Paul Liel. So we've been developing this together. And same process. 
But this model you see is actually a little um, enhanced for 3D printing, right? This is also where ZBrush can be handy for us to make the adjustments. Sometimes when we see the model looks good on the screen, it really doesn't mean that uh, we printed it's looking nice. So sometimes we're losing a lot of the details. So here ZBrush having this newer features and not new anymore, but um, it's amazing. Which you can actually uh, play with the res resolution of the model. It's under deformation and then under the contrast, right? You can play with this slice bar. Uh, let me see what happens here. I think this model is uh, because I decimated quite a bit. What happens there, Paul? Hi. Oh, I'm on a wrong, wrong sub tool. My bad. My bad. Yeah, I'm on a wrong sub tool. Or I think we are sliding on that mo model. OK, anyway, there's another one. All same process. Okay. Let's see if with this one we can use the enhance a little bit. Go for deformation and the contract. Yep. So you can really enhance the details. This is broken, but uh, you know, you got an idea. If we need to have uh, better details on the prints, we we'll usually come over here to use this feature to do the adjustment. All right. Usually. We want to go with the first print. We need to do several tests of print to make sure it comes out uh, good. Because uh, during the production, we also lose like 20% uh, of the details as well. So we need to make sure uh, those are all carried over. All right. OK, I don't know if there's any other questions or anything else. If no, Paul, you can take over. A question right here, yes. Do you want the mic? I don't know if it'll reach there. We can try. Oh, here we go. Now I feel, what is that game show? Drew? And on the board. Yeah, so right now I'm currently uh, working in like freelance 2D concept art. But um, I was curious, like in the studio, do you guys usually have people do like, are they usually well rounded in like both 3D and 2D? Or do you guys have just people who are specialized in their own thing? In my particular case, uh, case everyone is uh, specialized on something. That's the at the studio of ILM. That's what we do. So in my case, I'm a modeler. I don't really do textures. Right? I'm focusing on the sculpting part. But uh, it's all different. It's really depend on the studio you're working on with. So. When a, when a 2D artist is like transitioning their, their work to the 3D artist, do you guys mainly like just look for like turnarounds or like what do you guys usually look for? Do you guys look out for like fleshed out illustrations of like certain angles or like what, how do you guys usually work with the 2D artists? Um, myself is not really a 2D artist, but uh, usually when we review the portfolio, no matter if it's 2D or 3D, we try to read the rhythm of your image. And then usually I would recommend to do something that is based on uh, uh, something realistic that uh, people first of view can understand what it is, right? So many students, I also teach at the Academy of Art. A lot of my students come up with, uh, you know, creature design from their mind. They do whatever they want. But uh, when they put that into the portfolio, people don't understand it. So if you can say build your portfolio at the beginning to based on something realistic that will be more appreciated by people interview with you. Cool. All right. All right. I think that's it. Everyone, Anatomy Tools and Evolution. We got Andrew and Tan, and they'll be here at the booth. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you, guys. They'll be here still at the back of the booth as well. What do you got there, Lou?
The time has come to secure your boarding pass for Camp Mugraf. Tickets go on sale at noon Eastern time, April 20th. Set an alarm and head over to Camp Mugraf.